My name is Josh Obendorf, and I'm an elder candidate here at Icon Church, and today I'm going to be reading from Psalm 107, and you guys just sat down, and now I'm going to invite you to stand right back up. Okay. So we got some good stuff in here, so hang with me. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some wandered in desert wastes, finding no way to a city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted within them. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. Some sat in darkness and in the shadow of death, prisoners in affliction and in irons, for they had rebelled against the words of God and spurned the counsel of the Most High. So he bowed their hearts down with hard labor. They fell down with none to help. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. They loathed any kind of food, and they drew near to the gates of death. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. Some went down to the sea in ships, doing business on the great waters. They saw the deeds of the Lord, his wondrous works in the deep. For he commanded and raised the stormy wind, which lifted up the waves of the sea. He turns rivers into a desert, springs of water into thirsty ground a fruitful land into a salty waste because of the evil of its inhabitants. He turns a desert into pools of water, a parched land into springs of water. And there he lets the hungry dwell, and they establish a city to live in. They sow fields and plant vineyards and get a fruitful yield. By his blessing, they multiply greatly, and he does not let their livestock diminish. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Alrighty. Well, uh, for those of you I have not had the privilege to meet yet, my name is Josh. I serve as the lead pastor here at Icon. Uh, what a day, right? What a day. Um, just a heads up, today in this, for this sermon, uh, I feel like it's basically one long prayer uh, that right in the middle of it is just kind of a rant. Um, usually, I mean, my sermon is still as organized as I try to make it be. There's, uh, there's some things that I want to, uh, that I feel like I want to share on our anniversary Sunday um, that it's one of those places where it hasn't quite risen to my mind yet as much as I tried to get it there, but it's like in my guts. Um, and so if I start ranting, uh, just just be, be gracious. So, um, so what we're going to do is uh, we're going we're gonna to pray a good bit on the front end, uh, just a prayer of gratitude, and then we'll, we'll jump into this psalm. So would you, would you pray with me? Father. Father, we, we are grateful today for everything that you have brought us through, everything that you have held our hand along the way. We are grateful that you have never left us for a moment, God. That, that in the same ways that in our, in our personal lives we experience your faithfulness and your care, we have, we've experienced that as a church, that you care for us, God that you love your people and you give us your very presence. God, what a gracious gift you have given us in Icon Church, in the story of our church. I pray that today we would feel a sense of wonder that we should not be here yet for the grace of God. So we praise you today that you have held our hand. Father, we we want to publicly honor and praise you for people who have served Icon, like Paolo. Such a faithful, joyful servant, God. I'm grateful for him. Thank you for the, the gifts that you've given him. That before COVID would have been good, but in COVID were gold. So I thank you for your providence that that brought him here from the Philippines to New York and then to Seattle. It's your providence that brought him here for this time. And your word says to honor those to whom honor is due. And so we honor Paolo today, God. We honor you for the work that he's done for Icon. And we honor you, God, for the story that you're writing in him, that, that now he actually does get to, to take this gift that you've given him and expand it outward to where churches all across 
the United States can now benefit from his gifting. Churches that would never be able to find a guy like him can now actually have a guy to, to serve them. Is now spread much larger than anything Icon could ever do. And so I thank you for that, Father. I pray that you give him a fruitful ministry, and I thank you that he's still here, that he gets to still be a part of our story. And so, Father, now as we turn to your word, would you speak to us? I, I feel in my bones today that there are things that I want us to, to feel here that my words simply cannot do. And so would you translate whatever heat is in my soul that we might have together a, a zeal for your name. We love you and we entrust you in Jesus' name. Amen. Jude, should I just go to a hand mic? Where's he at? Ah, cool. Technical difficulties. Um, hey, one more time. Can we just honor Paolo real quick? Yeah. If you can't tell, my, my goal today is to get Paolo to cry as much as possible. So there's more to come, buddy. Don't you worry. <laughs> I'm joking. Well, I can trace my story uh, of coming to Icon back down to, to one phone call. A few years ago, my wife and I were, uh, we had just come through this season where we, we finally felt like we had a, a sense of conviction that, that God was calling us to come to Seattle that this was the place where he would have us minister and, and love and share the gospel and pastor. We were, we were clear about that in our souls. Uh, but the problem was is that we had a kind of a, a problem of opportunity. Um, so not many people know this, but when we were first exploring Seattle, uh, we had uh, Icon Church, which has been great. Uh, but we also had another job offer. Um, and this was at a church in the north side of Seattle. Um, and as I was trying to explore which church God would have us come to, I had a phone call with someone from this church. And on that phone call, I, I shared with him, like, you know, here's why I feel called to Seattle. Here's why even, you know, some of what you're doing there at that church feels interesting to me and exciting for me. Um, but I also shared that I was looking at a church that was in Capitol Hill that, that might have something that fits me a little bit better. And I remember, you know, talking on the phone with this guy, and he was, uh, you know, he was trying to, I don't want to, I'm trying to say this to where it doesn't sound like he was, he was, he was trying to convince me in some ways, um, but he, he stopped after, after I shared with him that I was looking at a church in Capitol Hill, he paused for a moment, long enough to where I thought we had been disconnected, and then he said, Joshua? I want you to know, I, I'm living here in the Seattle area for the last 20 years. I want you to know, I've never seen a church make it in Capitol Hill. That he had never seen a church that got past the first four or five years. That, that even if they did, they usually moved into a neighborhood that was maybe a little bit more easy, you know, easy for Seattle. <laughs> Or they just never made an impact. And so he finished his sentence with this. Joshua, sometimes with a place like Capitol Hill, it's better to just not try. And in that moment, I knew Icon was it. In that moment, I knew Icon was the one that God was leading me toward. Because I could not stomach listening to such cowardice being masked as, as wisdom. I, I, I could not stomach the thought of think, thinking so little of God and his power, of being so lacking such self-awareness to know your own story and how God pick, picked you up out of muck and mire, being unaware of that to the point where you think it's worth, it's not even worth trying. And I could not stomach. I refused to look at Capitol Hill with all of its beauty and with all of its ugliness and only see difficult people that are not worth the effort. Over that phone call, something, so, something came into my, my guts a little bit. <laughs> and, for, and it stayed there. And I, and I feel today, I almost feel more, if you can't tell, I feel a little bit more 
you see. Like, I, I can't, there's something there that I want to get across, but I, I don't know quite how. And so I want to invite you into today, as we celebrate this anniversary, to, to, to hopefully to share this burden that I have, to share this refusal to, to look at Capitol Hill and simply see problems, to simply see that it, it's too difficult. You could make it as a church plant a lot easier if you're in some other neighborhood or some other suburb. I, I want us together to refuse that today. And I think Psalm 107 is perfect for doing just that. And so what we're going to see as we go through this is we're going to see the psalmist kind of rehearse the, the, the type of people God is able to save. And he's going to go through about four different uh, scenarios or rehearsals to show that this is what God does, that this is who God reaches into the world and, and saves. And, and we're going to go through that pretty quickly. And on the last part of the text, I want us to sit down, and that's probably where the rant is going to happen. So first, let's look at who it is that God is able to save. Look at verses one through nine, and I'm going to read them all the way through. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands from the east and from the west from the north and from the south. Some wandered in desert waste, finding no way to a city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted within them. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way till they reached a city to dwell in. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. For he satisfies the longing soul, and the hungry soul he fills with good things." So the first rehearsal of redemption that the psalmist gives here is those who are vulnerable because of their disconnection and isolation. So what's, what's described here is a, a person wandering in a wasteland, they're alone, they don't, they don't have a, a city to dwell in. And in the context of that, as they, they experience this disconnection, being away from society and being vulnerable because of that, there's something in them that, that rises up and they cry to the Lord. And there we hear this, this repeated phrase all throughout the psalm. They cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. And so what I see here is that those who are alone, those who are isolated, those who are disconnected, God cares deeply for them. And in fact, leads them by a straight way till they reach a city to dwell in. It's, it, it shows this picture of God, God hearing the cry of this isolated person, holding them by the hand, and then leading them on the straight way into a place of connection and community. That's one type of person God saves. Look at the next one. The next rehearsal of redemption, verses 10 through 16. Some sat in darkness in the shadow of death, prisoners in affliction and in irons, for they had rebelled against the words of God and spurned the counsel of the Most High. So he bowed their hearts with hard labor, and they fell down with none to help. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He brought them out of darkness and out of the shadow of death and burst their bonds apart. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. For he shatters the doors of bronze and cuts in two the bars of iron. This next rehearsal of redemption comes for those who have, have rebelled against God and as a consequence find themselves enslaved, kept captive behind what the psalmist describes as this, this affliction in irons. And so this person, whoever it is, God has saved from being enslaved, from being behind bars and irons that, that, that they can't get themselves out of, that they've that they've created a life out of rebellion against God. They've created a life in which they feel hemmed in and not... They're trapped. They're, 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 they're not safe. They're not flourishing. They're in darkness. And again, God does what? He delivers them from their trouble, delivers them from their distress, that as they are bowed low, feeling alone and enslaved, and they rise, in them a cry rises to the Lord, the Lord responds and saves them. Next, I'm going to bring this all together. Don't worry. Verses 17, some 
were fools through their sinful ways, and because of their iniquity suffered affliction. They loathed any kind of food, and they drew near to the gates of death. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He sent out his word and healed them, and delivered them from their destruction. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man, and let them offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and tell of his deeds and songs of joy. So another rehearsal of redemption is someone who, through foolish, sinful ways, now has their body falling apart. That, that they've literally backed their body into destruction and dysfunction through something they've given themselves to. They suffer and so much so that they loathe any kind of food. And they draw near to the gates of death. And there, again, they cry to the Lord, and the Lord delivers them from their distress. And then finally, this last little rehearsal of redemption, verse 23. Some went down to the sea in ships, doing business on the great waters. They saw the deeds of the Lord for his wondrous works in the deep. For he commanded and raised the stormy wind, which lifted up the waves of the sea. They mounted up to heaven. They went down to the depths. Their courage melted away in their evil plight. They reeled and staggered like drunken men and were at their wits' end. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He made the storm be still. And the waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad that the waters were quiet. And he brought them to their desired haven. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. Let them extol him in the congregation of the people and praise him in the assembly of elders. So this last rehearsal of redemption has to do with some sort of business going on, going, to, going down in ships to the, the great waters. And so what's being expressed here is that there, there are these businessmen who are going out to sea in order to create a life for themselves, in order to create security and commerce for themselves. And they find that the very thing they went out to do actually begins to rebel against them as the, the sea, the, the area where their business happened, began to cave in on them. And so their, what they thought was going to be a place of safety actually turned into a place of danger. And then the Lord delivers them. Do you see what I'm trying to get at with these rehearsals of redemption? <laughs> That God, in each one of these four, saves the, the lonely and the disconnected. He brings them into a city to dwell. He gives them a community where they can flourish. He takes those who are enslaved through their sinful ways. Those who have created a life for themselves and by creating their own life have ruined themselves. And feel enslaved and in affliction. God delivers them. Those who through their sinful ways are now suffering the consequences in their body, God saves them. And even those who are in the business world, not just to build commerce, but to build a life for themselves that will protect them and from whatever sort of danger that will give them the things that they think they need, God saves them. Does that not sound like Seattle? The lonely and disconnected, the isolated, God brings them in. The one who is trying to create their own life and through creating their own life actually realize that they're enslaving themselves. God delivers them. God delivers those in Seattle who are living in a false narrative, a false story, and find that it's binding on them when they thought it would be freeing. God delivers those who through their sinful ways are now sitting on the streets, on the edge of death, loathing food itself. God sees them and delivers them. And the one who looks to business, who comes to Seattle in order to, to build a resume, to work for Amazon, to work for this company, and have this idolatry of business, this idol that if I can just get this career, if I can just get this thing on my resume, then I'll finally feel okay. Only to come to Seattle and one, endure a global pandemic that threatens their very career, but also find that even when they have the best success they could ever dream of, there's something still painful about it. There's something still that's not there. God delivers them. And so when I look at this text, when I, when I think about this, if we're going to take God at his word, then whatever that man said over that phone call is ridiculous. That there's, there's not one category of person in Seattle that God is unaware of, that God doesn't care about, 
that God can't awaken to salvation. God sees them. And so I, I just, I, I bring up that, you know, all of this and that story from that phone call because I, I, I think it's in us as well that we are intimidated by our context. There's no reason for that, friend. We, we wonder, what, what can we really do? <laughs> I mean, what, 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 what impact are we really going to make? Are we really going to be able to see people come to know and love Jesus when there's such animosity, such hardness of heart? This text should show us that this is exactly what God does. The, the, the psalm rehearses the story of redemption for, for men and women who are in the exact same spot as so many in our city, delivering the lonely, delivering the enslaved, delivering those whose foolish ways have almost led them to death, and God humbling the prideful idol of business, removing its appeal and showing that dependence on him rather than our own skill or ambition is the way to our desired haven of peace and fulfillment. This is, this is just what God does. And so I'll be honest with you. When I, I mean, when I heard that over the phone, one, I was angry. I was like, this is, this is how many kids do we have in here? This is dumb. <laughs> <laughs> this is not right. But more than that, what, what bothered me about it was not just his unwillingness to see that God can save people who he may, might be intimidated by. But more than that, the lack of desire for something more. You see, what's, what's wrong with what that guy was thinking was not just that these people are hard and this is a hard place. <laughs> What's wrong with that is that he was perfectly fine with resting in that. Because he, you know, he even said it in his language, right? It's just not worth it. He didn't, he didn't want something more. He, di he didn't want to see something more for these people and for some church in Capitol Hill. And that's the problem. It's not just that we think that our context is difficult. It's not just that we should not be intimidated by the people who God has called us to save and to reach. More than that, we should want something more. We should hunger for God to break in. Not just believe that he can and see like, yeah, God, that's what God does. Great. No, we should want that. And so starts my rant. Look at verse 33. He turns rivers into a desert, springs of water into thirsty ground a fruitful land into a salty waste because of the evil of its inhabitants. He turns a desert into pools of water, a parched land into springs of water. And there he lets the hungry dwell. And they establish a city to live in. They sow fields and plant vineyards and get a fruitful yield. By his blessing, they multiply greatly and he does not let their livestock diminish. This is what I want to sit down on for a little bit. The hardness of heart in our city, the antagonism toward the gospel, all of it is, in the end, a cute little defense that, that God will, will break apart if he wants to reach someone. I'm not intimidated by that. I'm not worried about that. If God is set on saving someone in our city, no amount of hardness in their hearts is going to prevent that. It's just not going to happen. So because of that, that part of the psalm that we went through of rehearsing redemption, that encourages me, but what gets me what grabs me is this little text right here. Because this, on our anniversary, I want to say to you, this is what I'm hopeful our church turns into. We can celebrate the last two years, but I, I'm, I'm, and I want to do that. But I'm more interested in what does the next 20 look like? What's that going to look like? What's that going to be? I hope it looks like deserts turning into pools of water, parched lands into springs of water, where a city, a, a people is, is built and established. And what do they do? They, they sow fields and they, they plant vineyards. They see fruit. And more than that, they multiply by God's blessing, not by man-centered strategies, but by God-ordained blessing. That's the type of church I want this to be. That's what I feel in my bones. But there's one little qualifier here. Here's the thing. 
If we want to become a fruitful church, like described here, that refreshes one another with the gospel, one that grows not because of man-centered strategy, but God-ordained blessing, if we want to be on that, there's one qualifier that this little ver- these little verses show, and that's hunger. The, 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 he turns the desert into pools of water, parched lands into springs of water, and there he lets the hungry dwell. There's a certain type of person that God wants to bring this to. As God reverses the difficulty of the desert and turns it into a spring of water, he lets one type of person dwell there, and that is those who are hungry. Those who, who want it. And, and this is a theme in, in how God works, right? God isn't out to find someone or some church who is already capable within themselves and then simply co-sign on what they're doing. God's not going to do that. God doesn't co-sign on our capability. God is on the lookout for the hungry. He's waiting to use those, to bless those, to even multiply those who understand their need and act on that need by asking him, by asking him to step in and do something. He's ready and eager to be with those who want him with all of their hearts. Not just, not just a, a faint desire, not just a, you know, I, I, I'm a part of a church and so I should say that I desire God, but with a, a hunger, a desperation that if this doesn't happen, if God doesn't meet us and make us into this type of people, then what was the point? Because he, here's the thing. I, I, you know, I read the Bible and, I, and I, I see men like Moses who on the edge of the promised land is there saying, if, if you don't go with us, God, then, then what's the point? What's the point? We don't want to go. If, you're not, if your presence is not going to go with us, then what's the point? Or I hear people like David in the Psalms who says that as the deer pants for the streams of water, so my soul longs for you. He's thirsting for God. And then I, re- I, I, I see men and women in, in church history who refused to, to live a little diddly life and sought hard after the presence of God, who had a deep sense of hunger. Men like, men like John Owen who said, Oh, to behold the glory of Christ, on this would I live and this would I dwell until all things here below become as dead and deformed things, no longer in any way calling out for my affection or embrace. A man who got it, who knew that if I can see this, if I can see the glory of Jesus, then all the other things down here, even the good things, the wonderful things, in comparison, they become as dead and deformed things. Or, or men like Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who stood up against the Nazi regime and gave his life for the sake of fidelity to the gospel. It's been going on for centuries. We see it in the Bible, this hunger and this want. And my question, the thing that, that haunts me, is where is this in us? Where is this? Not just an, an icon. I'm not, I'm not pushing you. Where is this in the church today? Have we been so seduced by consumerism in our culture that church, discipleship to Jesus, is nothing more than just an add-in in our, on our life that, that sprinkles on a little bit of peace, a little bit of joy when we're feeling down? Instead of having a, a deep sense of hunger. When you, like when you read David in the Psalms, what is he? It doesn't sound joyful. It doesn't... Sounds painful. That's how much he wants God. And I, I am haunted by how, how little we actually feel that. That's, that's what bothers me as a Christian and as a pastor is that we not only expect so little from God, and so we don't try in places like Capitol Hill, but also we want so little. We want so little from God. Why is it that we can live our little Christian lives going to church every Sunday, 
our community group once a month, reading our Bible inconsistently, have a prayer life that is mostly bullet shot prayers said under our breath in some moment of desperation, and be content with that. Be. I feel like we're doing the thing. Well, I, I prayed. Right, but God has invited you into contending. <laughs> Not just bullet shot prayers. God has, God has gone to great lengths in the death of his son, Jesus Christ, in order to open up for you, Christian, a life of joy in his presence. That's what he's opened up to you. That's what he's offered you. But we want so little of it. Which is, <laughs> I'm going to say this, and it might be too on the nose. <laughs> Which is why, on a day like today, there's a real debate in our mind as to whether we should come and celebrate the anniversary of our church, of a, of a church that should not be here and yet is by God's grace. There's a debate as to whether we should do that or go watch 25-year-olds play with a ball on TV. <laughs> that, I, I get that. I played football for nine years. I played baseball for 12 years, even though it doesn't look like it. I'm a sports guy. But it's alarming to me that there's that debate in our hearts. It's alarming to me that we would even give credence to something so def certainly fun and exciting, but in the end, something so small. When God is opening up his life to you, his heart to you, to come in, and an icon isn't anything special. I, I'm not saying come here in order to hear me preach. I'm saying come here in order to, to meet with God. That's why we're here. We're not here in order to just do sermons and songs and a little bit of community sprinkled onto it. We're here so that we could hear from God and be carried on in our discipleship to Jesus. That's what we're here for. And so this is, this is what bothers me. This is what is my biggest fear as a pastor. I'm not really afraid of our neighbors. I'm not intimidated by the secular story, especially as it falls apart right now through global pandemics and supply chains and <laughs> secular stories falling apart. I'm not intimidated by that. The antagonism of our city towards Jesus bothers me, but it doesn't make me feel threatened. But the one thing I am deeply afraid of as your pastor is that we would not be hungry. I'm afraid we would want too little of God. I'm, I'm burdened by the possibility of settling into just surviving as a church plant rather than thriving as a place where God meets us and the realities of the gospel are put on display through our relationships. Here it is. I'm afraid that even in our context that should make us more serious about the gospel, I'm afraid that we're going to slip into the all too common temptation of compartmentalizing our lives to where God is over here at church, maybe, and the rest of our lives are lived like any other Seattleite. I'm worried that we'll be so enamored by our strategy as a church that we forget to want God, to make the main thing the main thing. I'm anxious about our capability as a church, our gifting. We have guys like Kyle and people who come through like Palo and Alona and so many of our community group leaders. I'm almost anxious at our capability, at our capacity even to strategize because our capacity to strategize gets us thinking, but it rarely gets us praying. So I, I, I'm intimidated by how, how, like, everything I love about Icon Church and its leaders also intimidates me because I also know it can be too quickly and too subtly used as a way to just, just do the thing apart from the Spirit of God. So that's why I'm afraid. <laughs> that's what I, I, I feel today, that we'll have this low view of the Christian life with such a shell of what God, God calls his church to be. Because on the day, on the day that Icon Church becomes about Icon Church and not about the presence of God meeting us, empowering our work, the day that that happens, Icon Church dies. Maybe not organizationally, 
Maybe not financially, maybe not even practically week to week, but in substance, it does. And so that's why I'm, I'm doubling down on this today for our anniversary. <laughs> Happy anniversary. <laughs> Because I, I, I don't want us to slip into a shell of what I really believe God wants us to be here. I don't want us to be seduced by consumerism or by our own capability and capacity. And by God's grace, I, I really don't think this will be the story of Icon. I pray every, I pray every day for you <laughs> that your Christian life would be full of substance and joy, that the Spirit of God would interrupt you at moments while you're working and doing these things that, that with thoughts of how you are loved by God and that would draw your heart in order to want Him and be near to Him. I pray that for you every single day. But I, I felt such a, a necessity to, to stand and even on such a special day, give not just warning but exhortation. That for the next, that we can celebrate everything that God has taken us through in the last two years. While at the same time, looking forward to the next 20 years and expecting a lot. I'm not talking about building a brand or building this massive machine, but a lot of ministry. A lot of chains falling off of people. Marriages being healed. Sin being repented of. So much, I want to see fruit in our lives together for the next 20 years. Some of you, probably a lot of you won't be here in 20 years, but I, I hope you will. Don't leave Seattle. But our, our future is not, is not dependent on how good we are at things, how good our strategy is, and I believe in all of that. But our future as Icon Church, even how we've made it through the last two years, maybe without even noticing it, is that God will take us by the hand as we stretch out and say, God, would you, would you hold our hand? Would you carry us forward? Would you give us power? Would you give us love for our neighbors? And that we would submit to that power that he wants to give. Because here's the thing, there's a power that we don't get to control. We just get to submit to it. And I, and I really believe that God wants to empower the work of Icon Church. Not because Icon Church is special, we are not the solution. You know, all the church experts would say that this is not a way to build a church, but I'm going to say it. We are not the solution to Seattle. We are a witness. That's more than enough. And so that we, we church who takes our God at his word and expects great things, who studies the Bible, looks throughout church history, sees all the ways that God has shown up when his people cried out that he delivers them from their trouble and from their distress. This is the God we serve. This is the God who's opened his heart to us. And this is the God that for the next 20 years invites us into something more. Would that we would want it. Would that we would be a church in Seattle that doesn't just, doesn't, doesn't just survive but thrives. And I want that, not just because Seattle needs Jesus, but because Jesus deserves Seattle. Jesus deserves the praises of this city, and this city is praising almost everything but Jesus. So I want to be a church for the next 20 years that stands up and says, with hunger and desperation, that he is our God. He's the one we look to. He's the one we're here for. And he's the one who empowers our ministry. And so I want to, I want to take some time. I'm almost out of time. And just pray. It would, be, it would be foolish of me to just sit up here and, and, and rant and not actually together pray. So would you, as I pray, would you pray with me? Don't, don't just listen to me pray, but would you pray with me for the, the story of Icon Church, the arc of that story to be wonderful because of the people who are here, but more than that, because of what we want from our great God. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you, have, that you have held our hand. And at the risk of almost saying our history is not enough, I, I ask you that you would give us more. 
that you would hold our hand tighter, that you would give us men and women who right now are asleep, who are hungover, have no idea of who Jesus is, that you would give us the privilege of participating with you in awakening them to the gospel, the glory of Jesus Christ. Would you give us that privilege, God? And God, would you give us a, a hunger that week in and week out we would, we would want you, that we would have great dreams for what you could do through our church in this city, not because we're capable, not just because we're gifted, but because you are with us. And so, God, would you, would you help our hearts even right now and our own personal lives to turn away from the small things and, and recalibrate back to you as the one we want, as the one we desire? Would you forgive us for how small our desires are? And would you be gracious to expand our hearts together as a church to want you more, to seek you more, to love you more. I know, God, I I know that that is not something that we can do in our own power. Our spiritual disciplines do, do a lot, but they can't do that. Only your spirit can. And so would you help us? Would you be gracious to us and give us a, give us a hunger to see you at work? Give us a hunger to, to have your presence meet with us here in our Sunday gatherings, in our community groups, in our own personal fellowship with you. And would you protect us as a church and as individuals? Would you protect us from living such a small life, such a small Christianized life that on the surface might look okay, but, but deep down is so much less than what Jesus died to give us. Give us a holy discontentment. And God, I pray that in that discontentment, we would would run to you. And we would watch, even as we sang earlier, God, that all that you say, (laughs) it does come to pass. And you've promised great things to your people, to your church, And we want to see those things come to pass, but we want to do it rightly, which means staying close to your side. Would you keep us, would you tether us to yourself? In Jesus' name, amen.